listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. Welcome to another edition of the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. I'm your host, Femi Abebefe. As always, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcasts. Our producer, Elliot Bowman, with us on the ones and twos, as always. And Michael, obviously, we hit a, a nice pivotal weekend in the NFL. Thanksgiving has come and gone, but the news this Monday morning, though, comes out of Charlotte as the Carolina Panthers, after just 11 games, have fired head coach Frank Reich of what has been a disaster of a season one in 10 offensive showing no signs of improvement and owner David Tepper decided he's had enough. Well, I mean, he's watched, uh, you know, since the bye week when they were 0 six, you know, he's watched the offense, uh, not throw the ball, not move the ball, not score more than 15 points. You know, you knew this was coming. I mean, he's watched CJ Stroud down in Houston, do all the good things that he's done there. And he's had to watch this quarterback, not do anything, not any prog- make any progress whatsoever. I think Frank really, I think Frank, I said it this summer, I thought Frank was, you know, the team wasn't getting prepared. The team wasn't anywhere near where it needed to be. But when you look over Frank's career, I I don't think Frank has recovered from the Carson Wentz thing. I I think Frank has post-traumatic syndrome. I really do. I, I think he went, he put everything into Carson Wentz. He went to bat for him. You know, he, it's one thing to go to bat for you know, for Philip Rivers, you knew it was a short time thing. And, and, and obviously it worked out, but to go to bat for Carson Wentz and to really basically say, this is our guy. I know this is our guy. And then have it fail miserable, fail miserably. Uh, I think it created a, a real post-traumatic syndrome. I think we don't talk enough about that with coaches and people. And I think he lost his fastball. I mean, he lost his fastball. And from that moment forward, his last year at Indy to these 11 games, you never saw the coach that we saw in the initial time he first went to Indianapolis. So there's a reason. You know, he lost his fastball. And I, and I think that was the case. I mean, Tepper had no choice. Tepper had no choice. He, he saw it this summer. It was there. It was obvious. He had no choice to make, and he did it. And so I, I think, you know, now he looks for – what will be the next one? You know, what he'll try to do, I'm sure, is say, well, let me try to hire Ben Johnson and have him fix my offense. I think Tepper has bigger issues than someone coming in and fix his offense. I think he's taken over a team that he needs to have somebody teach him how to become an owner. He needs to teach him some how he can use his intellect to best serve the organization, not run the organization. That's going to be the biggest challenge that awaits him. And David Tepper, the owner of the Carolina Panthers, put out this statement this morning saying, I met with Coach Reich this morning and informed him that he will not continue as head coach of the Carolina Panthers. I want to thank Frank for his dedication and service, and we wish him well. Effective immediately, special teams coordinator Chris Tabor will serve as our interim head coach. Senior assistant Jim Caldwell will be a special advisor to offensive coordinator Thomas Brown, who will take over play calling duties. You mentioned how Tepper needs to kind of have somebody coach him up how to be an owner but he was a minority owner with the pittsburgh steelers like that was like that's like the model organization for ownership and stability and now here he is doing what he's doing in carolina well you could say the same thing about jimmy haslam i mean that's what they all said about jimmy haslam when we went to cleveland yeah you know you know and and we all said well we're getting an owner that understands that it's good you got to lay a foundation you got to build a culture you got to do the things that it takes you got to have a structure you can't listen to the noise. You can't you can't talk to ten thousand people a day. You can't rely on the media to to tell you which way what's wrong with your team. You've got to be able to diagnose your team and figure out how to solve the problems. And you know, it, like we say all the time, I mean, this is truly the Dunning Kruger effect. Yes, you have expertise in some areas in terms of business, but when you try to apply them to this team, it becomes a little bit of an issue. Uh, temper could be a tremendous resource, you know. But he's got to be the one driving the questions, asking the right things, making sure people are on top of it. And he's got to be able to close ranks and not not listen to so many different people. And that's what the Steelers did. Nobody understands how the Steelers got to where they are. Right. Nobody nobody's read football done right to understand that that it took a lot of bad years in Pittsburgh for Dan Rooney to fix the problem. Right. It took him. 
to understand that his father's way of doing it wasn't the right way. And he changed the model. When Paterno turned the job down, he changed the model and hired Noel and built a culture that sustain, sustains itself today. Yeah, hey, the Pittsburgh Steelers is the model of consistency and stability there. Frank Reich, his tenure as an 11-game coach is the shortest the NFL has seen since 1978. San wow. Francisco fired Pete McCauley after nine games in the 1978 season. So like, this is who came in after McCauley? That would be Bill Walsh, wouldn't it be? That would be Bill Walsh. And what happened after that? Eddie DeBartolo said, you know, because the, the remember, DeBartolo gets to Walsh because he hired Joe Thomas who to be the general manager because he was told by people in the league office, let somebody come in and run your team. And back in the, back in those days in the late seventies, the GM ran the football operation, the Jim Finkses, those people, they ran everything. The coaches coached and the GM GM. So that, so he was told to hire Joe and then Joe makes the ridiculous OJ Simpson trade. And yeah, or no, it was it this and then Jim Plunkett, all the, it made did some disastrous things. And, and that's when Eddie decided to change, and he got the model right, bring in Walsh. I think this is where Tepper is right now. I think he needs to sit down and say, okay, what, what is truly wrong with my organization? Do I, what is the process? I hired Matt Rule. What was wrong with Matt? I hired Steve Wilkes. I didn't like what he did. And now I hired, I hired Frank Wright. Like, what makes me believe that through interviewing, I'm going to be able to find the next best coach for the team? Like I, I think that's really the that's a false assumption to make, and I think you have to understand that you need processes, you need culture. Look, it's hard as hell today to build a sustainable entity, especially one where you know once it gets a little rough, people are like ready to back out. You know, the media, you should get fired. You know, because once you start firing people after eleven games, you know, and the media is going to want you to fire them all the time. So. He needs to really kind of do an autopsy on why am I here? Where did I go wrong? And what have I done wrong along the way? Just like he would do with his hedge fund. Just like he would do with his hedge fund. And there's there's only 32 of these jobs, head coach in the National Football League. But I almost feel like he has to kind of sell somebody on taking this job. Because if you're a head coach in Canada, let's say you're Ben Johnson or you're Mike McDonald, the Ravens defensive coordinator. Are, are you lining up for, for Carolina or are you seeing what else is out there? Because the last two guys got whacked pretty quickly here. And if things don't go well early on in the tenure, maybe I'm going to be the next guy in line that gets fired after one season. Well, that, that's a, you know, that's a fair question, right? So you, you need to find out what is going to make Tep, what does Tepper want? See, when you force Tepper to ask the question about what he visualized the organization to look like, once you a- ask him that, Once he defines that for you, then you can build what he just said. The problem is he doesn't know what he wants. He doesn't know what he wants. He wants the quarterback to play good. He knows that he's read enough about winning football teams. You have to have a quarterback. So he went out and he paid a king's ransom to get a quarterback. But But he left out part of the equation. He left out part of the culture, right? It's the same thing. I mean, Justin Herbert lost last night, right? They got a quarterback at the Chargers. Staley's one game over 500 you know, with him is there. You know, they've got other issues. They have the quarterback. It isn't just get the quarterback. I know Brady won six Super Bowls in New England. I get that. He won them all. He played offense, defense, kick game. He did everything, right? By himself. I get that. Ball by himself, right? You know, he kicked <laughs> yeah. that field goal in the, in the in, you know, he did all that. But, it, but we don't, we lose sight. It takes a, it takes a core element to build together. And if you don't have an infrastructure, if you don't have that, if you don't have the right piece in the right place, you know, to, to build around the quarterback, to understand it, Sean Payton is doing exactly what everybody should be doing is he sees his team. He's doing what I, what we said, the Apollo 13 thing. He sees his team. Wilson's got limitations. He's got some strengths. Play to those. I'm going to play it. I'm going to avoid losing the game and I'm going to get myself back into it. He's not doing anything revolutionary. He's just being really smart. He's not listening to go for it on fourth down like Doug or or with one second to go in the half when Doug Peterson gets gifted three points because of a you know a bad coverage and a great throw and doesn't take it in yesterday's game. So I think it t- it takes a little bit of that. Like you've got to have somebody who sees the team and can build the team. He needs a team builder. That's what's so lacking in the NFL today. There's no team builders. 
there is no team builders. And so there's a bunch of play callers. And that's what happens. And so why don't the plays work? I don't know. Oh, yeah, the bad line, bad this. You know? I think that's the key issue. Speaking of the play callers, uh, ESPN's Jeremy Fowler reported that some in the building were not happy with Frank Reich taking back the play calling from Thomas Brown. Now it'll be Thomas Brown for the next six weeks. So maybe there was some internal stuff going there as well because Reich There's gave up the calls. There's been internal but, stuff yeah. going on there, Femi. It's been going on for a while. Frank, look, I'm telling you, Frank has post-traumatic syndrome. He, Frank didn't want – Frank got this job. I don't think he wanted it. I think Frank was done. I think he moved to Carolina to retire, to play the back nine. You know, and he went there for the interview and, you know, and he even brought people with him from 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 Indianapolis. He's kind of put this up, but then he didn't really do the things you got to do. You you got to have that appetite, that hunger, that uh, that really that I'm going to prove it wrong to everybody. He didn't have that. He showed up with no real zip to him, you know, and there's no because what happens to all of us is we get caught up because of our experience. We, we become reluctant to change. Well, I've done it this way. I'm going to keep doing it. Well, you've got to be adaptive to change. And Frank got this kid in shotgun the, the whole time. How, how long have I been bitching about yeah. him being in shotgun? I mean, I know he's short, but he needs, he needs help. He needs help. You know, you got to build a team around what he can do. He's a quick decision maker. He's a three-step drop thrower. It's a shame. And then they have no run game. They pay all this money to Miles Sanders. The Chuba Hubbard's the best back Better, on the team. Yeah. I mean, nothing looks good. And, and he's wondering what happened. David Tepper's wondering what happened. What happened is you don't have a cohesive team building operation. You don't, you're don't. you trying to take parts from here and put them in this car and take parts from that car, put them in there. And you don't have everybody on this. You have everybody on the same page. They all tell you you want to win, but nobody's aligned. What about the general manager before we run up against the break here? Scott Fitterer, does he survive this as well, or are they going to be in, have a new GM in Carolina? I mean, it depends on who was giving him advice. I mean, if he said to him, I wouldn't hire Frank Wright, he should keep his job. But, hell, I, I told Al, Al Davis not to hire Art Show, and I got fired. So, I mean, who knows? Who the hell knows? <laughs> yeah, who the hell knows? But the Carolina Panthers now have a six-week head start on finding their new head coach down there in Charlotte. We'll get to the games on the other side. This is the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and v Here is Femi Abebefe. Hey, now, we've been rolling with these picks here, folks. I know, obviously, on the GM Shuffle podcast, we don't talk a ton about the betting. We do more of that on our v show, The Lombardi Line. But, Michael, yesterday you went 4-0, and handing out some picks. And, hey, we got a Black Friday deal for our folks that want to subscribe yeah. at vcin.com. $60 through May 1st. Uh, that deal goes ahead and ends on November 30th. As we're sitting here on November 27th, take advantage if you want to get some of Michael's picks there if you like to uh, dabble in the wagering. But, uh, hey, it was a good day for you betting-wise, and uh, we can celebrate that here on the GM Shuffle. Oh, without a doubt, I was three and zero in the Russo contest. Oh, <laughs> the Russo go. contest! We were going at it on on Friday afternoon, Thanksgiving, because the the Black Friday game was going on, right? Mm-hmm. And I was like killing Salah, and he was defending Salah, saying I'm being too hard on him, that I must have a personal agenda, you know. And I'm like, no, I don't. But I, I mean, he's two and zero going into tonight, right? So okay. I got my bear pom poms. I've got a voodoo doll over here, here pinning it into the Vikings. Yeah, so I can pick up a game on them here and get the T box back. I got to get the T box back. But you know, it's funny. All I kept thinking about, and we'll get to that hail mary. All I kept thinking about when he threw the hail mary, and 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 Boyle didn't reach the end zone, was I looked at my phone because I expected it to ring from from wherever he is, and he would be Al Davis. And once that throw went in the air, he would have called me on the phone and said, uh, I-, I just want to know one fucking thing here. And I said, yes, Mr. Davis, what's that? Th- did he practice that at all during the week? Did we practice that fucking Hail Mary during the week? Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Davis. No, we didn't. Did that fucking coach know he couldn't reach the end zone? Uh, probably not, Mr. Davis. Click. The phone would have hung up. And Russo's defending him. And Russo's fucking defending him. I mean, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Like, that's not, I mean, 
I, I literally, I could tell you that my phone was going to ring, but <laughs> anyway, nonetheless, we got, we got, we got, we got <laughs> Sunday night. We Let me say this to you. Yep. So I have my phone thick in there. So now I'm sitting on the couch. I got big daddy over here, by the way, every bad play that's run <laughs> big daddy's line to every bad play. They must've stole that from the fuck. They must have stole that from oh, the no. fuck. The, the reverse, the reverse that didn't work. Oh, they got that from the fuck. Anyway, so I, I mean, I'm sitting there on the couch, three and zero. I'm happy. I'm going to watch Sunday night football. Mm-hmm. I got the I picked the ring, and on my screen comes, oh no! It's like when Buzz in Home Alone saw when when uh, Kevin saw Buzz's girlfriend. Buzz, yeah. your girlfriend. I was like. Oh no! Where's Collinsworth? I mean, what? Oh my God! I got the clapper turned into the happer. Yeah. I mean, is there anybody happier than him? He was having the time of his life, man. <laughs> he was having the time of his life in that booth. Like the broadcast starts, it's like, "Hey, Mike Tirico here from SoFi Stadium. Chris Collinsworth is actually off today for Thanksgiving weekend. Here is my is he off? <laughs> He's got six months off. Like, he needs a day off. I mean, I don't get a day off. You don't get a day hey, off. Like, Collinsworth's not doing two first. We're not doing two two in a week. Right? I mean, I mean the best thing about – I mean, I mean the best thing about Herb Street is I get to follow his dog. His dog doesn't get a day off. I mean, his dog's traveling with him everywhere. I mean, God bless Ben. I love it. I mean, what the – I mean, Chris – and then we get, and then, I mean, Bill Simmons put out there all these cliches. I mean, it was like he had a Rolodex he was going through. Okay, I need to talk about this. I need to talk about that. We Forget about what's going on on the field. I'm going to talk about this, this, and this. Kellen Moore did this. Kellen Moore did that. Like, well, that, oh, my God. Like, that's his guy. That was a three. If you're David Tepper and you're watching that, are you interviewing him for a job? Just think about it that way. I hope to God not. <laughs> I, I saw somebody tweeted. I forgot. I wish I could give them credit. I, I started busting up laughing. They said, uh, Jason Garrett with the insightful analysis on the broadcast saying, hey, on this Chargers offense, you got to look out for Justin Herbert, Keenan Allen, and Austin Eckler. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, why not tell us why they can't get the ball to somebody else? Why not tell us why Justin Herbert's so shitty in the second half? Why not tell us that Brendan Stanley's one game over 500 as a head coach and yeah. that actually Anthony Lim was a better head coach? Like, why not talk about that? I mean, between him, I went from Romo, who loves everybody. I mean, did, did Romo love everybody or what? Nice, I mean, nicest Romo guy on the planet. Actually said, he actually said on the broadcast that Vaughn Miller's coming back to life. I looked in the game book this morning after watching the game. Vaughn Miller's not even in the game book. Forget about coming back to life. He's not even in the game book. He participated. He didn't make a tackle, an assist, or nothing. He's talking about Buffalo's playing their best football. Their best football? Are you kidding me? Josh Allen's playing his best football. The Bills? Great. <laughs> oh, I mean, this like – at some point, well, how much – can we do a little work before the game? Do we have to tell that everybody is the greatest player in the history of the sport? I mean, really, do we have to do that? No, I mean, all you have to do is do, be associated with the Dallas Cowboys and you get yourself a nice job. That, that's all you got to do. <laughs> that's all you got to do. I'm, I'm sure there'll be somebody who's on the Cowboys right now in 15 years that'll be calling games, and, uh, and we'll enjoy it then as well. But – in terms of what we saw on the field, Baltimore looked a little shaky, especially in that second half there. Like they, they were leaving that door wide open for the Chargers to go right through it, but uh, the Chargers unable to do it. Ravens win 20 to 10 there. Uh, not their best performance, but a win nonetheless as they go into the bye at 9 and 3. Yeah, I mean, how many games this year have we seen the Chargers have the ball with the, with a chance to win the game yep. or tie the game, you know, and they can't come through? It's like every you other know, week whether at least. It's, it's every week, right? I mean, it's like they constantly can't make a play when we need them to make a play. It's a killer. We, we got Miami. They had the ball. Tennessee, you know, in overtime, they get the ball. The Dallas game, the Lions game, Green Bay, they had the ball last week. And then this week, like at some point, you can't make a play to win it. That's why, to me, everybody wanted the Chargers. And, they, you know, they're always in close games. I get that, right? They are. But they can't win a close game. Once that line went from three and a half to three, you had to take it, right? You had to take it as the because you had a chance to either push it or you're going to win it. Now, I know that everybody, well, you got lucky because Flowers ran the ball. Well, how many times does Justin Tucker miss a 44 yard field goal indoors? Seriously. Never. I don't think I've ever seen it happen. (laughs) No, of course you don't see it happen. It doesn't happen. And so, I mean, look, they're not, the the thing is, they're not out of it yet, even though they want to be out of it. I mean, the, 
the, at the end of the day, for me, when I watch the Chargers, they have no power to their team. They've had no power since he's been there. They don't play with any physicality as a team. They've got some good players, but they when they have to throw it and they have to pass protect or when they have to stop the pass or when they have to pass rush, they're non-existent. That's why he's 23 and 22 as a head coach. Yeah. It's and it's sitting at four and seven right now. Season slipping away. I mean, it's pretty much already slipped away when you look at the AFC wild card. They're gonna have to pull out a miracle, win the rest of their games, and get some help to get into the playoffs here. So maybe it's Brandon Staley that we uh, see removed from post at season ends here for the Los Angeles Chargers. Let's get to the game though. That was a lot of fun to watch. They're frustrating at times, but a lot of fun to watch. That is the game that Jim Nance and Tony Romo were doing yesterday in the city of brotherly love. Eagles beat the Bills in overtime, 37-34. A lot to take away from this one another game where i swear we're having the same conversation with philadelphia didn't play their best game but they found ways to win at the end of the game yeah i mean look you know we always talk about the super bowl hangover for the losing team right well the eagles have had that really they are the they're having their super bowl hangover but they only have it for 50 minutes in the last 10 minutes, they find ways to win the game. They have a they have a 50-minute hangover, and then they play like a champion for the final 10. And you credit them. Look, I bitched all last year they played a Gonzaga schedule. They're resilient. You're To beat Philly, you're going to have to play 60 really good minutes. And you're going to have to keep scoring. You can't go in the fourth quarter four plays and punt like, the, like, the, like the, they did. After, the inter- after he throws the interception, right, the second half, they miss a field goal. Right, killer. They come back, score a touchdown. They go interception, punt, touchdown, end of the game. Now, he didn't even try to score. He had the ball with 20 seconds to go in a timeout, and he chose. I mean, he's been scored on with 13 seconds, yet he kneeled it down. Okay, I'll give him that. Go to overtime because the Eagles have been playing a doubleheader on defense, right? Yep. Like when you got that ball in overtime, fuck it. We got to score because if we give it back to them, they're going to score because he, he coaches this team. Like they're great on defense. I mean, do you realize the Cowboys, the, the Eagles outgained them five point eight yards to five? I mean, they outgained them. The problem was the Cowboys. The, excuse me, the, the the Bills were so good on third down. They were in twenty two third downs. They converted thirteen of them. They had five hundred five yards. They they averaged five point five a play. Philly averaged five point eight. But again, here's what I always say: at the end of the game, when you need a stop, when you need to rush the passer, when you need to make a play. Where was Buffalo's defense? Where is this nickel defense that's supposed to be so good at critical times? You know, and you could say, well, I mean, they made a 58-yarder in the pouring rain. Yeah, they did. I, I mean, mean, it was what a kick that great was. Kick. What Holy a great hell. kick. But, I mean, but the kid's a great kicker, though, yeah. right? Yeah, he's the really good. The kid's a great kicker. I mean, here's your, here's your second half if you're the, if you're the uh, Buffalo Bills defense that is built to play from in front. Right, it's built. You give up the three play punt, touchdown, touchdown, punt, field goal, touchdown. I, I mean, like you, 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 you could sit there and I mean, Josh Allen just put the team on his back. It was a classic Buffalo Bill game, right? It was let me run the ball, nine carries, eighty-one yards. Let me take the game over. I'll throw it fifty-one times. I don't give a fuck, right? He threw. He only had twenty-nine completions. That's all he had. Think about that. A lot of drops. Hard weather game to throw the ball in, get that. But to me, I mean, like at some point, I assume today we'll read after the Frank Wright that 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 he had to fire the linebacker coach. What other <laughs> options did he have? <laughs> the, 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 the defensive backs coach in Buffalo is fired now. <laughs> That's what we're going to find out. But uh, on the Philadelphia side of it there, because like this just has become really, really impressive to me. And this is a stat from a uh, NFL network research that said that the highest win percentage by a head coach in games that his team has trailed in minimum 25 games. Highest win percentage was John Madden at 63%. The second highest Nick Sirianni at 61%. We always talk about like, you always bring up that Kyle Shanahan stat. Like why, like what's his win percentage when his team is down eight in the fourth quarter. Like Sirianni is almost like the reverse of that here where his team is down. I mean, they've trailed in the second half in how many games so far this season, and they still find ways to win them. And if not for a bad Hurts interception against the Jets, we could be talking about an 11-0 team here. Yeah, and, you know, Pat Summit said this, and, she, and she's right. I mean, uh, she said this about her basketball team once, and, and I believe it to be true. She said, if I can get this team to lose twice, they'll win a championship. And the Eagles – Losing to the Jets helps them, 
but the resiliency they built up to these close games will help them even more. They're gonna you gotta play sixty minutes to beat them now. There's just no way they're gonna they're not going away. I cannot wait to see Sunday's game. Niners at the Eagles. Where Michael? The Eagles. Home underdogs, according to the betting market. I wanted to ask you, though, a question about the Buffalo Bills when we come back here on the GM Shuffle. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and v Here is Femi Abebefe. You know, Michael, yesterday felt kind of like a pivot point watching that Eagles-Bills game. That game being in favor of Philadelphia sort of vaults them into being in full control of the NFC East and maybe the inside track on the one seed. We'll see what happens on Sunday when they play the Niners. But on the Buffalo side of it, though, it kind of feels like as they're heading into the bye at 6-6, six and six, out of the bye they have to go to Kansas City. Like, this, are we talking about this team is not making the playoffs? Like, that feels like that's where we're at after this loss here to the Philadelphia Eagles. Yeah, I mean, right now they're not. I mean, right now they're not in the playoffs. Yeah, they're the 10th I mean, seed. Look, you know, they're the 10th seed. Denver's playing well. Houston's playing well. I don't think Indy's going to continue, nor do I think Cleveland can continue. We'll need to find out about Miles Garrett's shoulder. And, of course, DTR's concussion, right? So he gets hurt. Uh, I think I think Denver's playing really well. The, the Denver's playing within the confines of who they are. I think they play Houston this week, right? Don't yep. they go down there and play Houston? Big, big game. So that, that's going to – that's a big game. That's a playoff type game. So, you know, I, I don't see Cleveland hanging on to it. I don't see, you know, I mean, I think Pittsburgh can hang on to it because they win so ugly. Uh, but Cleveland, because of the quarterbacks and the injuries, if they lose Miles Garrett, that's a problem. I don't see Indy doing it. I mean, Indy was a beneficiary of a of a, a buck defense that was beat up and Baker had chances to make plays. They couldn't quite finish them off. But I, I would rule Buffalo out. I wouldn't say no for certain, but the schedule's so goddamn hard. I mean, remember yeah. last last time? I mean, Josh Allen's 0 for 6 in playoff in overtime games, mm-hmm. right? I think the only one – now, the Chief game, he didn't have a chance to get the ball. But, you know, that play at the end of the game where they have – they get zero coverage. He knew it, and he's got Gabe Davis and kind of was a funky throw. He threw it – he threw it inside – Gabe threw it, you know, Gabe kind of broke it to the pile. Yeah. Yeah, I I mean, there it is right there. And then still, Femi, right? You you know, you go up three, your defense has got to hold them. I know Philly's really good. I get that, right? But you got no pressure. I mean, Hertz is running around there, and then he runs. How many more times can he run quarterback draw and still get it? After the game, Jordan Mailata said we were surprised at the look that they gave us there because, like, we, we run this in the red zone quite a bit. They run it all the time. Yeah, you got to play. He's the back in the red zone. He's the ball carrier. You know what shocked me about that game early in the game? I thought Philly was passing way too much. I I thought to me you got to you got to wear Buffalo down, right? I mean, I think you got to go into the game with a mindset that you're just going to throw, make Buffalo have to defend it. And then at the end of the day, when you look at the stat sheet, I mean, Philly had 32 rushes for 185 yards. They only threw for 200 yards. I mean, think about it. They ran the ball. I mean, it hurts. Was there, had fourteen carries for sixty-five, and Swift did. You know, I mean, again, this is a class. Like I said earlier, classic Buffalo game. They have forty rushes eight, for one hundred and seventy-three yards. Eighty-one come from the quarterback. I mean, he's their best. He's their best running the back. He's their best. They're not a good team. They have a great quarterback, and he makes mistakes. Granted. But he covers up for so many of them, you know. He covers up for and that he covers up for their defense. If they don't make it, they got well. They play Kansas City coming back, right? Yep. Kansas City, and then I think then that's home against Dallas, I believe. After that, yeah. So bye week yeah. at the Chiefs, home against Dallas. Are, are there what's their net three weeks look like here? As they already but, stand at six and six. Right. The year they went to the conference championship game. Uh, hold on, I'm going to get it here. The year they went to the conference championship game in 2021, right? They played a loss. Okay, they had an overtime loss to the Bucks. That was a great game. They got behind in that game. That was the Brady yep. game, and Brady let them back. Okay, they had four games remaining, They, but they were against Carolina. They beat New England. They beat Atlanta, and they beat the Jets to go to 11. They, when they lost to Tampa, they were 7-6 and six in that overtime game. This team has a different feel to them than that yeah. team. This team was is different defensively than that team was. I, you know, like where is where is Ed Oliver? Where where are these guys that are supposed to be their best rushers? 
Like wh- like I said earlier, where's – I mean, I know Von Miller's. There's life in Von Miller. I'm looking at the stat. I can't find them. I mean, they, they had two sacks in the game, Settle and Linville Joseph got the sacks. Both Linville Joseph, they're both run players. Well, Tony Romo told me that Ed Oliver is playing as good a defensive tackle as anybody else in the league, so he's got that going it's for unbelievable. him. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it's just – I mean, it's just he throws stuff out there that – you just sit there and say, like, what are you saying? Like, I mean, to- Tony's, you know, Tony's golfing during the week, man. I mean, what do you, what do you think he's it, It's <laughs> pretty – it, it's golfing. clear that that tape doesn't go on. It's clear that tape doesn't go he's, on. He's, he's playing about 72 holes minimum per week. <laughs> I, 72 per week? Are you kidding me? He might be playing 72. He, he's No, he's playing 144 minimum a week. Are you kidding me? Let's, me? I mean, I want to talk about Browns Broncos though before we get off track with Romo's uh, golfing skills, which he is pretty good by the way. Uh, the Broncos beat the Browns twenty nine to twelve, and this is another one of those games like you said earlier in the pod. Like, hey, like the Broncos know who they are; they're not going to make mistakes. They're going to turn you over. They did that once again with the Cleveland Browns. I mean, the Browns had three turnovers in the game. Russell Wilson played within himself, made a couple plays when he had to. As Denver now have won five straight games. What an unbelievable turnaround, and they're right in the thick of the AFC playoff race. Yeah, I mean, this is really a Bill Parcells style of coaching that Sean's doing. You know, he kind of rallies his team. He, you know, they throw out, the, throw out the Miami game. They don't mind it. I mean, they had 37 runs, 30, 39 runs. The longest run was 24 yards. Wilson, Wilson had 11 carries in the game. Think about that. Wilson carried the ball 11 yeah. times in the game, 22 passes for 134 yards. You know, here's a guy. The thing is, here's, here's what I really want to hit on more than anything. Wilson has become likable to his team. And I mm-hmm. don't think we talk about that enough in terms of quarterback's evaluation. Does the team like the quarterback? I'll give you the perfect example. Yesterday in the Meadowlands, Tommy DeVito <laughs> against Mac Jones. Right. Yeah. Mac Jones. And this you can't prove this. Right. You can't prove this is to me is my observation from watching it from being around Brady. Right. When Brady was 40 years old or 39, one of the things was we were very concerned about connecting to the younger player. How was he going to connect to the millennial? How was he going to connect to a guy that was different than him? Right. Yeah. That's a hard thing to do because being connected to the quarterback is part of the team. There's two leaders every team has. The head coach, you've got to have his personality, and to the quarterback. They want to follow him. They want to follow him. And when you watch Mac Jones and Tommy DeVito, they're both not NFL caliber quarterbacks by no means, right? But the players on the Giants like DeVito. They really do. You could see they want to play for him. When he makes a mistake or takes a sack, they want to play for him. And he wants to play for them. When Mac does it, going back to his cheap shots in his league and his career, yeah. all the things that, that there's, you could see there's a disdain for him. Like you could see, there's no sense of energy. There's no, hey, he's my guy. I love this guy. No, no. Like they don't. They're taught. Like he blames everybody through his body language, through his mechanics. And I think go to Carson Wentz. What killed Carson Wentz was it his arm strength? No. Was it his was it his athleticism? No. It was he couldn't connect to his teammates. They hated him. What did what did Jim Mercer say? Couldn't wait to get him out of the building. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> On record he said that, yeah. I mean, Mac Jones is the same way. Bailey Zappi's not endeared him. If Bailey Zappi had more Tommy Tommy DeVito like qualities in terms of leadership and and embracing it, they might embrace him. But they're void of that. I mean, Kyler Murray went through the same thing in, in, in Arizona now. They say Kyler Murray's turned the corner and he's been endearing himself to his teammates. But we miss that. We miss that. How does he connect to his team? How does he do that? You know, C.J. Stroud connects to his team. You know, I, I, I spent a lot of time at the University of Arizona, and they went through a coaching change, uh, not a coaching change, so a quarterback change, where they went from Dayla, from this Delora kid who was the Pac-12 Freshman of the year, right? Yeah. And they went to this young kid, Noah Fajita. Uh, Fajita. Fajita and, yeah. and this kid has incredible instincts. He has incredible leadership. He's, he's 5'10", maybe. He's got a great arm. But he, but the team, you could just feel the team loves him. I'm not saying they didn't like Delora, but they love this kid. Like, he's a leader of their team. They turned their program around because of that. Because of that. 
And that's what we're missing in scouting. We're Zach Wilson, nobody on the team wants to hang out with Zach Wilson. Nobody. Nobody, nobody wants to hang out with Zach. Nobody wants to hang out with Mac Wilson. Mac Jones, I mean, nobody wants to hang out with him. You can see it on these teams. So when you see a bad quarterback like DeVito, where they'll hang out with him, they'll go over his house and have chicken parm. Like they like him. He's no good. They like him though. And I think that's where where we lose sight of it a little bit and when we're evaluating these quarterbacks because what is the likability of the player? And Russell Wilson, and this is really comes back to Russell, that, that Sean's made him more likable. Sean's, because in Seattle, he was not likable. Off the record or on the record, they didn't like him. And they, and they played that way. But Sean's made him more likable. And then he's basically said, you're going to do what I tell you to do because I got clout and I can do it because yeah. I've won a Super Bowl. And we're going to do it my way. We're not doing it your way. We're not letting – nobody's saying let Russ cook anymore, are they? Nope. You don't hear that shit anymore. Nope. See, that's, that's what has to happen. And you can't make the quarterback – like Belichick can't make the quarterback likable. I mean, you just can't. I mean, when he does so many dumb things and then he goes to the press conference as well, I just got to do better. And then he's in the game pointing at at, 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 at uh, Gusecki for running the wrong route. Yo, dude, you know, you've lined up in the wrong formation. You've gotten things all screwed up. Like, you're not likable. It's one thing to be bad, but the players have to like it. Let me ask you this. You think Jimmy Garoppolo is a good player, not an elite player. But what made Jimmy Garoppolo and Deerham The team loved them. Yeah. San Francisco <clears throat> loved them. They believed in them. There is no belief in Matt. There is no belief in Zach Wilson. There is no belief in some of these guys. And that kills it. And that's what I think Sean deserves a ton of credit for, is getting the team to believe in Russell. Yeah. I mean, well, Sean Payton came in immediately and said, hey, we're not doing that coddling shit. Like, we, like all that stuff, like, we're not doing any of that, which what the last regime was doing. Like, Nathaniel Hackett, as a first-time head coach, was kind of being like, all right, Russ, like, whatever you want to do. Like, hey, man, we're whatever partners. Like, 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 we'll do it your way and all this stuff. And, like, especially when Russ in Denver has no skins on the wall, that's not going to, like, ingratiate yourself to your teammates there. Whereas in, in Seattle, maybe you can get by because, hey, yeah, you won a lot of games and all this stuff, whatever, we'll put up with it. But in Denver, those guys weren't putting up with it. And that's why you saw, like, the sidelines every other week look like a mutiny on the sidelines last year in Denver versus this year. I mean, it's a complete turnaround to where everyone loves everybody in Denver. And it's a credit right. to Sean Payton. I mean, right, Ritter. They, he's not playing very good, but they like him. Yeah. I mean, when, when Josh McDaniels put – put Brian Hoyer in the team. He lost the team because the team likes O'Connell. They'll play for O'Connell. They're not They're not good enough, but they'll play for him. Well, let's talk about the NFC South quarterbacks because there might be another quarterback in that division that falls under that category as well. This is the GM Shuffle. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and v Here is Femi Abebefe. You know, a big theme of this Monday podcast as we're reacting to all of the Sunday's games has been about quarterbacks endearing themselves to their teams. And I teased it and said, hey, maybe one of the quarterbacks in the NFC South falls into this category to where we should discuss this. And that's in New Orleans, where the Saints just lost to the Falcons yesterday, 24-15. to And my question to you, Michael, is has Derek Carr in 11 games, endured himself to his New Orleans Saints teammates because from my vantage point, looks like things are a little bit off the rails there offensively. I mean, this is something you're not going to prove and all the players will deny it, but you could feel it. I mean, you could feel it. I mean, it's a classic Derek Carr game, right? Throws for 300 yards. You know, the numbers look good. Red zone efficiency, 0 for 5. Okay, turns the ball for a pick six in the touchdown. Score 15 points, lose the game. Yeah, I mean, th- there is no connectivity between Carr and his team. There wasn't any in, in Las Vegas, whether it was when 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 he got drafted, whether it was with Del Rio, whether it was with well, Dennis Allen for one year, Del Rio, and then it was Gruden. I mean, there's no connectivity. They, there, there's no, oh, we're going to play for this guy. He, he, there is none of that. Likeability doesn't, it, it's not there. And then when he turns it over in the red zone, they have to kick five, five for six on field goals. I mean, and they're losing. I mean, the players just, you can't, here's the thing we don't, we don't count. Just because the guy's the quarterback, just because he has a varsity jacket on and he walks around and he goes to the prom and he's got the pretty girl that everybody likes him. You got to make your teammates like you. 
you got to make your teammates like you to buy to get them to buy in. Buy in yeah. I mean, Desmond Ritter's no good, but he. I mean, they buy into him. They're bought into him. I mean, they like him. And after he threw that pick interception in the red zone, they still fought back and made plays for him. Whereas on the other side, no. I mean, at what point do you say we just go with Taysom Hill? It's once the ball crosses midfield, just put Taysom Hill in the game. I mean, if you're Mickey Loomis, you see this. Like nobody's going to come out and say, "Oh yeah, that's true." Lamar, you know, like no, but no player is going to say it. But the team says it on how they play. Look at Kenny Pickett. You think they don't like Kenny Pickett? <laughs> They play their ass off for love Kenny him. Pickett. He's not even good. They love him. <laughs> they love if Carr him. was in Pittsburgh, what do you think that would look like? <laughs> Everybody <laughs> said, oh, give Derek Carr a great defense. He's going to be great. Bullshit. He can't connect. He can't lead his team. Leadership is an important quality of the quarterback position. I thought Mac Jones had leadership ability. I thought he was a leader. I thought he was an overachiever. That guy is going to work. He's going to study. He's going to get everybody to buy into what he's doing. Completely wrong. Completely wrong, right? It's the same thing when you go back and look at Trey Lance. Can Trey Lance lead? Yes, yeah, sure. He can throw the ball. I mean, the reverse is Jameis Winston. The locker room loves Jameis Winston. He's a leader. The problem is he turns it over. So if you're Dennis Allen and Mickey Loomis, what would you rather have, a great leader, a quarterback, and manage him? Or would you rather have a guy the team don't want to play hard for? That's what I don't understand. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've, we've been on record saying that let's give Jameis a try and see what happens with this offense. This, the, you're going to get the turnovers, but you, at least you're going to get the explosive plays. And I always think back to, it was, I think it was the Thursday night football game when they played the Jacksonville Jaguars and Cards like kind of yelling at Olave, sort of gesturing, saying like, hey, you got to run this route when the ball is in row G. And then after the game, Olave's asked about like the offense and like just w- watching that post game interview with Olave talking to the reporters in the locker room, like you could see this was a guy that was holding a lot back. Like he was like, I mean, we just got to figure it out. We got to go back to the tape and figure think, it out. It's <laughs> what do you think Mickey Loomis is thinking? He just gave this guy forty million. Yep. What do you think he's thinking? He's thinking now I know why the Las Vegas got rid of him. I, I mean, yeah, he'll go out there, he'll look great. Yeah, he'll look a, great. He's but pr- are we going to win? Are we going to win tough games? Fuck no, we're not going to win tough games. I mean, it's it's the killer of all killers. It's good enough to get you fired. That's what it comes down to. But it comes down to likability. Is he likable? Well, you know, it's funny. When RG3 came out, now there's revisionist history on this. One of the things that that the Shanahan family did not like about RG3 was likability. When they went to work him out, none of the teammates rallied around and came there. There was no, He couldn't get the people in there. Now, people will deny it, all that, but that's the core. Was he talented? Yeah, he had talent. There's no question. Could he connect to his teammates? No. None. You heard it on the campus. You heard it there. That's that was the thing. And we don't and we don't talk about it. We don't talk enough about it. When we watch when you watch DeVito, who's, you know, struggling, but, they're you know, they're making plays. Kid breaks a tackle. Hyatt makes a great catch in traffic. I mean, they want to play for him. Meanwhile, on the other team, Parker won't go inside on a slant. He's got the ball thrown on his back shoulder. He knows he's going to get killed. And then he's over there pointing at him for not coming inside. I mean, come on. that You see it. It's obvious. Yeah, I said, I'm not going on that suicide mission. <laughs> you can forget that. It's going to kill me. Gonna do, so forget it. Um, I no. mean, think about it. Brady, when he started out, was Brady. Brady was always likable. I mean, Brady had a hard time connecting because of the age gap. I get that. But what, what did he do down in Tampa? He connected with those guys. Yeah. I mean, oh, they love Baker him. Mayfield, that's the one thing Baker can do. Even though he's not any good, he can connect. Yeah, I mean, you see, like, guys, are, they, they, like, Tristan Wirfs is always on on uh, Pat McAfee's show and say, hey, Baker's a dog, Baker's this and that. Like, And, like, you watch the team, they, they've lost five of six, but they still love Baker because he, maybe he's a natural-born leader. Last thing on this game, though, I did want to give props to Desmond Ritter on the TD pass to Bijan Robinson. Beautiful throw. Hit him right in stride yeah. there with a little bit of a pressure there. Uh, Ritter has gotten a lot of flack from me included. I'm not a big fan of him, but that throw was beautiful for – Finally, the Falcons using Bijan Robinson. Imagine that, uh, since he's a pretty good player. Uh, last game, though, let's hit uh, is the AFC South showdown. Jacksonville takes control of the division, beating Houston 24 21 in what was a wild back and forth affair. Questionable officiating on both sides, but Jacksonville yeah. gets the win nonetheless. 
Yeah, I mean, I thought the officiating was horrible. I mean, Jacksonville had four first downs by penalties in the game, and and they were all timely first downs for them. I mean, the decision at the end of the half, I mean, they, they had 10 seconds to go in the half, and they hit that over route to Kirk, and Kirk steps out. I mean, there were three free points he got there, three free points, and he doesn't take it. He runs that, you know, he, he gets under the center, and they pitch it back. I, I just don't get it. You know, and then they miss a field goal, which gets gets them back in. But to me, this was a game where finally, finally, I thought Stroud made some poor decisions and looked like a rookie. You know, he gets, takes a horrible sack on a screen pass. Yeah, takes another horrible sack on a three step drop. There's a golden rule, and it's it should be written. Everybody should understand it. When they call a spacing or a rhythm throw three step, if you get sacked, it ain't on the line. It's on you. It's on the quarterback. And he did. He just, he, he, you know, he tried to do things outside his comfort zone. And this is to be expected for young players. I mean, it really is. Yeah. And they were right there. They had a chance. I mean, they had a chance to win the game. And look, Trevor Lawrence, he's liked by his teammates. They play. Yeah. They still can't run the football, but they played hard for him. I mean, the screen kind of takes away some of the run game. So, I, I, I mean, I like Houston. I think Houston's going to be – look, Houston will play Denver tough this week too. That's going to be a really fun game out there in Texas. Last thing on this game, what did you make of D'Amico Ryan's going for the field goal there on that fourth down? I know it was like, it was like what, fourth and 15 or fourth and 17, something yeah. like that. Like, Obviously, it was going to be a tough kick with a backup kicker because Fairbairn's on IR. I, I would have liked to put the ball in Stroud's hand to see if he could pick it up, but, I mean, I guess D'Amico Ryan thought that he could make it. Well, I think he thought, you know, I put he put the ball in, in the kid's hands three times before and he couldn't get 10 yards. That's so true. why not try this? You That's know, true, yeah. I mean, you know, and then on the, the one drop, you know, he made the mistakes. He took the sack. I mean, if he doesn't take the sack on the three step drop, pass, all they were trying to do was get the ball in field goal range. I mean, when they called that first and 10 play that he took the sack on, they were just trying to get in field goal range and he took the sack. So that that'll that'll wane your confidence a little bit, I think, when you when that happens. So look, I, I didn't think it was probable that he could make it. They had their chances to win the game. They had, they could have certainly played better, but Jacksonville made the plays and they got a lot of help. There's no question. I mean, the the the, the red zone penalties were killers. <laughs> Yeah, it's like back to back. Although we will say Houston got a big help with the no call when Stingley oh, yeah. picked the ball off. Like that was pretty egregious at the point of attack, yeah. and they just said, "Hey, we don't see anything." But hey, we digress. Yeah, why, not? Yeah. <laughs> uh, why would we call that? Why yeah. would we call it? You know, it's not like it helped them get the, ball, the interception. Uh, awards: Fred Palermo, best game plan of the week. Who's it going to? Well, I, I think it's going to Peyton. I think what he's done, he's not going to get coach of the year, but what he's done with this team is exactly what I love. He's he's built it. He's he saw his team. He went through it and he changed his team and now he's got everybody bought in. He's made the quarterback likable and they're going to be a good team. They're not great, but they're going to be hard to beat. The fraud of the week. I mean, it's again, it's Buffalo's defense. I mean, I know everybody feels, I mean, the offense was on the field for 92 plays. So Philly played a double header defensively and Buffalo should have been fresh. And yet when the game's on the line in the fourth quarter, they can't get any pressure on the quarterback or make a play. Who's going on the lamb? Well, we already went on the lamb after Thanksgiving. Uh, Del Rio, we had to put him on the lamb. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, Rivera really believes he thinks he can save his job. He's going to call the defense. My sense of this is, is I thought this, I said this on Mitch and Pauly this morning. At this point of the season, why fire the coach, right? Because then you got to pay the interim coach more money. You got to do all that. Is it really worth it if you're the Washington commanders? Let R Rivera. But if you think that they're not going to make changes in Washington based on what they've done, I have no idea. I mean, you're not watching the same yeah. games I am. And and <laughs> offensively, you know, they're going to get that quarterback killed. I mean, they're just going to get him killed. Yeah. No, the, the change will come at the end of the season. If you don't know, now you know. You better play. I mean, and this goes forward. You know, you better play 60 good minutes of football. To be the champion, you can't let up. you got to put your foot on the gas all the time. And Philly, even though they're playing like a – there's Philly's a – you know, the, there's a great song by – Billy Joel, it's called Summer Highland Falls. It's about sadness or euphoria. It's about a manic depressing goes back and forth. Philly plays shitty, but then they play great. They go back and forth. And those last 10 minutes, you know, the first 50 minutes, they might play like a Super Bowl losing team. But the last 10 minutes, they play like a true champion. You better play like a champion the last 10 minutes to beat their ass. It's only the Eagles where they're 10 and 1 and then trending on Twitter, fire Brian Johnson. <laughs> only, only the Philadelphia Eagles. <laughs> last thing, it is what it is. 
Well, I mean, the best teams to me are in the NFC. I think uh, even Kansas City, they spot the Raiders 14 yesterday and still come back and cover. Yeah, still cover. That was a little better. You know, I, I don't know how good the AFC teams are. I think San Francisco are a cut above both teams. Well, we're going to see San Francisco and the Philadelphia Eagles on Sunday. We'll preview that game in depth Thursday. Final thing, though, Monday Night Football, Bears at the Vikings. Who do you go got? Go Bears. Tonight? Go Bears. I got Bears. I got the voodoo doll. There we go. I got to get a Russo needs to lose. <laughs> I need him to lose. We'll both be wearing Justin Fields jerseys tonight. So I have Bears plus three no, and a half. Oh, I'm never wearing that jersey. No. <laughs> Hey, we need it for the contest, all right? <laughs> Thank you to our producer, Elliot Bowen, with us on the ones and twos. As always, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review. We will see you guys on Thursday to start to preview week 13.